Good morning and welcome to the New York Botanical Garden and here the historical Merritt's Library. I'm Vanessa Sellers heading the Humanities Institute supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Today's Science and Humanities Seminar is uh, co-presented with Fordham University. It's right across campus there behind that tree. Um, <laughs> so I'm really pleased to see you all gathered here and with me, the co-host professors Julie Kim and Claire Guerini, who are here this morning to join us for a special lecture, book signing, and discussion. And uh, we are, of course, delighted and honored to have professor and author um, James Delburger with us. He will speak to us as well as various scholarly respondents from, NY, uh, from New York City Universities, Kimberly Takahata and Justin Linz, graduates from Columbia University and NYU respectively. It was Professor Julie Kim who first alerted me to this amazing new book and Del Burgo's general interest in studies and suggested we do a shared program. That didn't take much convincing. And so here we are connected with this enthusiastic crowd and team of scholars and writers. Our focus today is an in-depth study of 18th century collecting, as explored by Professor James Del Burgo in his study, Collecting the World, Hans Sloan and the Origins of the British Museum. Here's the book. <laughs> After the presentation, uh, you can buy it yourself uh, just in time, perfect timing for Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother should have a book on Hans Sloan and the Museum. It's a no-brainer. <laughs> and you can have your own message uh, put in there. The original Hans Sloan books can also be admired here with various volumes. Amazing, um, rare uh, objects, museum objects from that period. And then here from the Historical Merits Library Collection. And before you leave today, if you're planning to take the tram around the premises, make sure that I give you a garden pass. Not needed for Fordham students, they can show their ID. And if you're a member, it is also not necessary. So it might be the best thing to just become a member of the New York Botanical <laughs> Garden. And then you can always go around with that tram. <laughs> Um, it's great, as I mentioned, to collaborate on these interwoven science humanities programs here with Julie, Kim and Claire Guerini, both conveniently situated nearby. Julie Kim is an associate professor of English and herself a researcher on areas of 18th century Atlantic science, including Caribbean plantation economies, resistance to slavery and empire. She has published essays on Afro-Caribbean medicine, indigenous land rights, and natural history in general, as well as currently works on a book entitled Gardening at the Edge of Empire, Colonial Botany in the Revolutionary Caribbean. So we'll see you back for that. <laughs> Claire Gellini is an assistant professor of history, also focuses on 18th century Atlantic world, the history of medicine, women and gender, and slavery and emancipation. She has published essays on 18th century science and currently works on a book entitled Slavery's Medicine, the Invention of a Disease in British Caribbean, 1741-1815. Please join me in welcoming <coughs> these two professors who will give the introduction for the morning. Well, first, I just wanted to start by saying thank you to the Fordham Dean of Arts and Sciences um, for helping to fund this project, as well as uh, the Department of History at Fordham. Um, but really, I wanted to reserve the most grateful thanks for Vanessa and for the Humanities Institute um, and everybody here at the library who helped make this event possible. Um, Vanessa, in particular, has done such a wonderful job of bringing together different people and constituencies through the Humanities Institute. So we're extremely happy to be part of this event today. Um, I also wanted to thank James, of course, for uh, coming up here to give the talk. Um, Claire, my colleague Claire, is going to do James's introduction, but I did just want to say very briefly that for many years, James has been an absolutely um, amazing mentor to me, so I'm very happy to be able to have him here today um, and to hear him talk about his uh, fascinating new book. <laughs> 
Um, but before I, before I let Claire formally introduce James, and James is part of the program, I just wanted to briefly introduce the two graduate students who will be responding. So if you look at the, if you've seen the program, you'll notice that James is going to speak, uh, read from portions of the book, and then we're going to have four responses, four very brief responses um, that will hopefully, uh, you know, draw out some of the aspects of James's work that we found the most interesting and provoke some questions uh, from you all, the audience. Uh, so just quickly, to introduce the two graduate students, uh, the first one who will speak is Justin Linz, who's a PhD student in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU, and within that, the program in American Studies. His cur current research inquires into the political life of microorganisms from the 18th century to the present. And his essay, Microlife, a Reflection on Species and Collaboration, is forthcoming in the Canadian Theatre Review. Our second graduate student speaker is Kimberly Takahata, who's a doctoral candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Her dissertation entitled Skeletal Testimony, Bony Ecologies in the Early Atlantic analyzes descriptions of human bones as sites of resistance in colonial accounts in order to disrupt depictions of indigenous and enslaved commodification and displacement. So um, I will now exit the stage. Let Claire <laughs> introduce you. Thank you. Okay. So I wanted to echo um, Julie's sentiments and to say thank you so much to the Nexus Sellers for organizing this, um, and to Julie for being an excellent um, colleague in helping me uh, get all this together, and of course to James for um, agreeing to come and accepting our invitation. So James Del Burgo is a professor of history at Rutgers, where he teaches the history of science and museums in Atlantic and global history. He received his PhD from Columbia in history, and he has published both scholarly and magazine articles on the history of science and collecting. And I just wanted to uh, take a moment to talk about uh, the influence of Del Burgo's work um, on uh, myself and this up and coming generation um, of scholars of uh, science and medicine. It's really impossible to overstate the impact of Del Burgo's scholarship on this current generation of scholars um, who are working on these topics. It was really groundbreaking um, to overturn our collective understanding of both the spaces in which scientific knowledge making occurred and um, this part its participants. His first book, A Most Amazing Scene of Wonders, chronicled how ordinary people in colonial America experienced the revolutionary effects um, of electricity. And of course, someone like Benjamin Franklin uh, did loom large in the history of electricity. Um, but James also foregrounded showmen and their lightning rods and electric eels, as well as medical experimenters and their electrical machines, and put these figures that we don't normally associate with enlightenment, sorry, I'm taller than this microphone, um, on center stage. And it showed us um, how these people that we don't normally think of as uh, participants in the history of science or central actors were really important. Um, so uh, he, there he was using electricity as a window onto how ordinary ex people experienced both the radicalizing effects of electricity and uh, contributed to the culture of electrical experimentation. And that book really pointed a way forward um, for myself and others who were beginning to think about these things um, and current generations of graduate students. Uh, it suggested that up and coming scholars can take a wrecking ball to the pantheon <laughs> this model which we put scientific, lone scientific geniuses in this pantheon. Um, and instead, that scholarship said, thanks. <clears throat> it provided a new model in the history of science and it put ordinary artisans and enslaved savants on equal footing with big wigs like uh, Sloan and Franklin. So thank you for that. Um, today he will read to us selections from his most recent book, of Collecting the World, Hans Sloan and the Origins of the British Museum, which was published in 2017 by Penguin, um, UK, and Harvard. The book has been widely reviewed, including the New York Times by the New York Times and the Guardian, and it was named Apollo Magazine's Book of the Year. It received honorable mention from the Association of American Publishers Prose Awards and won this year's Louis Gottschalk Prize from the American Society for 18th Century Studies. Now, as testimony to Del Burgo's long-standing commitment to recognizing the contribution of subaltern groups 
uh, in the history of science and medicine, his ongoing collaboration with the British Museum recently um, resulted in the museum acknowledging the role of slavery, Jamaica, and the African diaspora in Sloan's career for the first time on its website. And among his current projects, he's working on a global history of collectors entitled, Who is the Collector? Um, working with those other themes I just talked about. And a new global approach to the history of science entitled, Knowing the World. So thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, Vanessa, where's the water? <laughs> it's hiding there. It's hiding there. That, that was the only speakers. <laughs> <laughs> thank there you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Uh, it's such a beautiful day, such a beautiful time of year um, to talk about um, uh, botany in a botanical garden. Uh, so, I'd like to thank the New York Botanical Garden very much indeed for the invitation, and of course, Vanessa for all of her consideration uh, in um, arranging for this event, and of course, uh, my friends Julie and Claire and our colleagues at Fordham. It's wonderful to, to be able to do this. Um, I've given quite a, a few Sloan talks, of course, at this point, because uh, the book came out a year ago, so we did various talks across uh, different parts of Europe and across the country, and I just you know, wanted to say it's especially nice to give what appears for now to be the last talk <laughs> here, here at home in New York and in the Bronx, so it's nice to come back. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and wrap up here. And so I will read from the book. So this is going to be a bit of a reading. Um, and I like that format. I've come to think that scholars don't read enough. Why should it just be fiction writers? Because we write prose, and we write prose to be interesting, scholarly, but also to have the language resonate. So I've started to experiment with, with doing readings and, and letting the language uh, breathe for us. Um, uh, from the period of the 17th and 18th century. So that's what I will do, um, but I'll set that up first. Of course, the book is about Hans Sloane, uh, founder of the British Museum, 1753, the first free national public museum um, uh, that was uh, set up, opened in 1759. Sloane had died in 1753. Uh, no biography of Sloane since 1954. That was the last one. A lot of curatorial and scholarly work um, on different aspects of him, but nothing that attempted to integrate uh, that story. And as Claire was suggesting, it's a story about Sloan, but it's really an attempt to use Sloan to tell a story about global natural history collecting in the 18th century. And it's certainly part of thinking about the history of science and medicine um, through networks and pathways that connect many different places and many different uh, peoples. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about uh, Sloane's Jamaican botany today, um, but there are many other uh, peoples involved in the book. Sloane's collections were universal or encyclopedic, to speak the language of the time, but really plants were the core. You know, it's one of the interesting ironies of how his uh, collections were, have been divided up in London. British Museum, obviously, but his plants are at the Natural History Museum in West London in South Kensington. And these were core for Sloan. I mean, that's the holy of holies, I think, for him. Trained as a botanist, trained as a physician, uh, and really trained originally in, in apothecarial uh, arts. So herbarium, plants, central to, to what he did, and really central to the research in the book. <clears throat> uh, I spent weeks with the Sloan herbarium in what is now the Darwin Center uh, working on those plants and thinking about seven volumes of 800 uh, uh, preserved plants that he brought back from Jamaica, uh, preserved pretty much intact, came back in 1689. So that was core to, to what he did, that was core uh, to my research. Just to back up a little bit biographically, Sloan was born in Ireland. He was born in Ulster, moved to London, trained as a physician in London and in Paris, and then when he's, what, 27 years old in 1687, goes to Jamaica for 15 months, uh, plunging himself into the profitable world of Atlantic slavery, comes back with plants, comes back with plants that allow him to write an encyclopedic natural history of Jamaica, becomes president of the Royal Society, president of the Royal College of Physicians, one of the wealthiest society physicians in London, uh, and then assembles really a worldwide British colonial network 
then feed his collections with specimens and curiosities from East and South Asia as well as the Americas, ultimately resulting in his determination to uh, leave this collection to the British nation um, if Parliament would pay £20,000 for it, uh, for them, and uh, that's what happens. So, uh, it's a very interesting complex story, of course, um, that runs the gamut from uh, the atrocities of the slave trade to the legacies of public museums and free public access to uh, collections, which we all in some ways um, enjoy and cherish uh, to this day. Uh, I don't want to say too much more other than to preface uh, the reading uh, by saying <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is a reading um, that uh, essentially tries to um, immerse us in the process of how Sloan turned plants into pictures in Jamaica as a central part of his botany. If you look at those books um, afterwards, you'll see it, uh, essentially life-size images of plants uh, that Sloan produced in his Natural History of Jamaica. And I'm going to talk about the process by which those pictures were made. And the final thing I'll say in my preface is that the pictures, in a way, have often taken to be, uh, have been taken to be the, the story that counts about Sloan's natural history. This is pre-Linnaean botany. He's on the wrong side of a lot of uh, key moments in the classic history of science. He's not Isaac Newton. That's a problem. Uh, he's not a genius. He doesn't invent anything. Um, and in 1753, if we jump forward in time to Linnaeus' species Plantarum, where uh, in particular uh, with specimens like Theobroma cacao, uh, Linnaeus essentially says, if you want best pictures of, of you know, what does this actually look like, consult Hans Sloane's volume. Essentially, don't bother reading any of his words. You don't need to bother with the pictures, some of the best pictures we have. So that's one key into why this is so important, the legacy uh, of that, and, and picture making as a process. So we're going to try and understand a little bit of that through the reading. <coughs> now, pointer is hidden here somewhere. Yes, good. Um, so this is page 96. <laughs> Anyone who opens Sloan's Natural History of Jamaica is struck by the quantity and detail of the hundreds of life-size engravings that burst from the pages of its two large folio volumes. Consider his engraving of cacao. Well, sitting over there, we'll see it in a moment. The source of chocolate. Sloan intended such pictures not simply as supporting illustrations of the verbal descriptions of plants he also did compose and publish, but as carriers of essential scientific information about the anatomies of species which words alone could not arguably convey. These pictures constitute one of his greatest scientific achievements in providing a model of visual knowledge and by communicating the results of his Caribbean research to successive generations of botanists. Sloan stated at the outset uh, of his natural history that the book was based on local knowledge from, quote, the inhabitants, either Europeans, Indians, or blacks. But on only a few occasions did he credit slaves for accessing the specimens he gathered. The company in which he rode up to St. Anne's on the north coast of Jamaica, you can see in the middle of that screen, uh, uh, in, the, in the center, uh, Sloan's map of Jamaica, he rode from um, uh, the, the south of Jamaica, essentially around um, uh, 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 Port Royal, uh, up to uh, St. Anne's on the north coast, collecting specimens uh, as he went on one occasion. And the company in which he rode up to St. Anne's included both knowledgeable planters who traveled with him, and also what he called a very good guide, uh, most likely an African, though possibly um, uh, an, uh, an Indian. We don't know for sure. He doesn't specify. Blacks, Sloan realized, knew the island better than anyone. Writing about the Palma Spinoza Minor, the prickly pole, he noted that, quote, Negroes traveling barefooted through the woods very carefully avoid places where these grow because of the many prickles that fall from their stems and leaves. His Radix fruticosa lutea, or chew sticks, that were used by the Negroes for cleansing their teeth, consisted of a root taken up out of the woods of Jamaica by the blacks. Again, these are his specifications. There was no difficulty 
in the curing or preserving of this fruit for use, he wrote uh, for the Royal Society of Philosophical Transactions in reference to the Jamaica, uh, to Jamaica pepper. Um, because, tis for the most part done by the Negroes, they climb the trees and pull off the twigs with the unripe green fruit. Such acknowledgments were rare, but simply because Sloan said little about slaves' work in finding plants does not mean that it was not substantial. As the example of his colleague James Pettiver, another botanical collector based in London, shows very clearly, it was customary for naturalists, English naturalists at this time, not to credit the contributions of slaves, just as natural philosophers like Robert Boyle at the Royal Society failed to acknowledge uh, the laboratory technicians who carried out the experiments they then wrote up as their own. Notwithstanding the silence, there is little doubt that Sloan turned to slaves to aid his collecting, since he regarded Jamaican blacks as a living link to Spanish and Taino knowledge of Jamaica's species. Sloan therefore made sure to visit slaves' provision grounds, their own small plantations wherein they took care to preserve and propagate such vegetables as grew in their own countries, to use them as they saw occasion. He described several of their crops in his natural history and collected specimens that remain immaculately preserved to this day in the Sloan Herbarium at London's Natural History uh, Museum. We'll get to the image on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, his herbarium volumes, well, I should show you first this. That, that's the, uh, well, that's the cocoon-like structure of the Darwin Center and the Natural History Museum on the left. And inside, you see the uh, marvelous and impressive uh, pur purpose-built uh, facility for housing. Actually, what was a total of 334 herbarium volumes, plants collected from around the world by many different travelers between the late 17th and the middle of the 18th century astonishing collection, uh, first seven volumes of Sloan's uh, Jamaica volumes. These herbarium volumes then are, when you open them, astounding scientific pop-up books that contain dried fruits, leaves, and stalks glued to the page as they were over 300 years ago. For example, the great bean, Phaseolus maximus perennis, which was planted in most gardens, Sloan wrote, and provision plantations where they last for many years. on the right-hand side of the screen here, his sample of Milium Indicum Arundinaceo Caulogranis Flaviscentibus, <laughs> gotta love these polynomials, are wonderful, is a striking specimen of guinea corn or sorghum, quote, met with in some Negro's plantation. So that's a rather extraordinary physical link between the provision grounds of uh, enslaved Africans in Jamaica uh, and Sloan's herbarium in South Kensington. His okra, probably came from provision grounds too. Quote, Indians and Negroes commonly planted and used uh, the bell peppers that he collected as both medicine and food, and his Serotonii affinis siliquosa lauri folio singulari, <laughs> called bitchy by the Coromantin Negroes, as he wrote, was brought over on slave ships and used by blacks to treat stomach complaints. Rice was also, he wrote, sowed by some of the Negroes in their gardens and small plantations in Jamaica, whether Sloan seized the specimens he collected or whether he exchanged for them in some manner is unknown. And this is quite typical of Sloan's um, collections as they uh, pertain uh, to enslaved people. Uh, the, the method of acquisition is, is, not, uh, is not known. But, he know, but we do know that he certainly did talk as much as possible to enslaved people about the flora and fauna of Jamaica. Writing about the so-called hog doctor tree, he remarked that a very understanding black assured me he saw a wounded hog go to this tree for relief. <coughs> Once Sloan had plants in hand, preserving them required enormous care. He did not record the exact techniques he employed, but contemporary accounts provide a good indication of how he probably proceeded. Herbaria were collections of dried plants that originated as objects of spiritual devotion. But after the work of Renaissance naturalists like Luca Ghini of Pisa, they evolved into botanical documentation centers <coughs> replete with technical labels and notes. The practical demands were many. If the specimen was large, uh, the naturalist John Woodward advised in his 1696 printed instructions 
uh, for travellers on how to make collections, the taking of, he wrote, a fair sprig about a foot in length with the, low, uh, with the, with the flower on. For smaller ones like grasses and ferns, take up the whole plant, root and all. Desiccation was, of course, of the essence. Collectors should press plants between leaves of paper and hang them up to dry in the air, quote, at the top of some cabin to keep them from rotting. After thorough drying, they should then be placed between the leaves of a large book or choir of brown paper, spreading them smooth and even before transferring them to more fresh pages, quote, in some dry place till they be sent over and ultimately flattened with a heavy weight. Labeling such specimens <coughs> was then crucial. The provenance of every sample should be noted on an accompanying sheet, urged Woodward, with the names, quote, by which the country people call the plants and the medicinal or other uses they make of them. Sloan's uh, Essex colleague, John Ray, uh, botanist uh, John Ray, provided a model of exactitude in how to provenance, well, a, let's call it a 17th century model, I should correct that. <laughs> in one memorable instance, uh, John Ray, who lived in Cambridge and studied in Cambridge, he had described a plant in Cambridge as growing, uh, uh, quote, on Jesus College wall. <coughs> Sloan didn't always measure up, however. I found it in the woods, he later wrote, of, <laughs> of the Telia Forte Arbor Racemosa in the natural history. I cannot exactly tell where. I found it in Jamaica was a phrase he used several times. <laughs> unable, unable to, to summon further detail from either his notes or his memory. <laughs> Sloan's handling of cacao provides a vivid example of how he turns specific plants into pictures of scientific species. The cacao specimen he collected in Jamaica is stuck onto the 59th page of the fifth volume of his Jamaica Herbarium, which you see before you. The brown leaves of the cacao tree are <coughs> pressed onto the right-hand side of the page, where they have been glued and subsequently taped in place, with only incidental damage and decay over three centuries. Glued above the leaves are several of cacao's tiny flowers, also brown with age, while below a cacao nut or bean has been stuck to the page with fragments from the bark of the pod that contained it. In Jamaica, Sloan would have placed freshly acquired specimens into loose quires of paper, dried and repacked them in the manner described by John Woodward, before putting them long afterwards into the bound folio volumes of his herbarium once back in London, where his herbarium was pasted and stitched together by several different assistants. Once the plant was in place, Sloan wrote up a label and pasted it at the foot of the page. You can see there, it's a little faint, but it's there. <clears throat> to identify each sample whose names he derived wherever possible from previous descriptions in John Ray's Historia Plantarum, which he used as a guide to known species. But Sloan brought more than just specimens back from the Caribbean. Pasted opposite his cacao sample, on the left here, uh, <clears throat> you see a page of paper that came from Jamaica and which bears the striking image of a living cacao plant with its weighty nut-filled pods, uh, a stalk or branch of cacao with the fruit, as Sloan has labeled it there. The picture was not, however, drawn by Sloan. Most naturalists were not accomplished in artistic technique, since they aspired to be recognized as gentlemen authors and men of letters, and draftsmanship was typically uh, uh, the domain of artisanal dexterity, considered to be a, a lower status um, um, a person in this process of producing botanical knowledge. This picture of a live cacao plant was in fact drawn by one of Sloan's companions on the journey to and from St. Anne's, a minister by the name of Garrett Moore, who was, quote, one of the best designers I could meet with there. And so I carried him with me into several places of the country. Drawing plants in situ was another means of collecting them when one met with fruits that could not be dried or kept, such as the pineapple, which Moore also sketched for Sloan. Moore executed a number of drawings in both terracotta crayon and pencil, including many trees done from the life and in their natural bigness. Moore's sketches <coughs> were, however, only the beginning of the visualization process. <coughs> 
They provided the basis for a second round of illustrations completed years later, over a decade later, in fact, after Sloan had returned from London. Now, after Jamaica, Sloan became so busy with his medical practice, his work at the Royal Society, and his collections, that it was only during 1699 to 1701 that he commissioned Eberhardus Kikius, one of many Dutch artists working in England at the time, to complete his visual catalogue for the natural history. Kikius' task was twofold, to draw those dried specimens from Jamaica that Moore had not sketched in situ, that Sloan had brought back, but also to use Moore's original sketches of living plants in Jamaica and combine them with details from dried ones to produce composite pictures that captured all of a flowering plant's different parts and characters. The drawing of the live cacao plant in Sloan's herbarium is thus signed E.K. for Everhardus Kikius, but in reality it is a sketch done by Moore in Jamaica, which Kikius inked over in London a decade later, either to correct certain details according to Sloan's instructions, or simply to preserve the pencil sketch from fading. To this, he then added sketches uh, of dried cacao flowers, nut, and pod bark <coughs> done from Sloan's specimens. This composite picture of cacao, including both live and preserved dry elements, then formed the basis for one of the many hundred uh, engravings in Sloan's second Jamaica volume. That's the picture there, it's the same picture on the screen. And these were executed for him by a number of different draftsmen, Dutchman, uh, Michael van der Gucht, and an English engraver, John, John Savage, who worked at the Royal Society. <coughs> at one point in the herbarium, Moore and Kikius seemed to meet where both of their names appear next to a picture of a Jamaican jasmine tree. But this meeting is an illusion one produced by Sloan's ability to collate the work of different artists separated both by an ocean and a decade in time. There was, therefore, a distinct art to the naturalism of Sloan's pictures. He artificially combined the elements of both living and dried specimens in unified views to depict all of a plant's features. There are numerous examples of such artifice in his natural history. His engraving, uh, for example, of the mammy tree was a composite based on a drawing by Kikius, you see it on the screen here before you, uh, that again was combining elements from Sloan's dried specimen with a live picture Moore had done while in Jamaica. Yet Sloan evidently wished his readers to believe that they were seeing an individual specimen exactly as it was. So the line of shadow across the mammy fruit Moore and then Kikius drew, cast by an overhanging stalk, was retained in the final engraving, conveying the illusion of a specific plant drawn at a given moment in time. See there, the line of shade parallel to the stalk. Sloan's engraving of the clammy cherry tree, which you see here, likewise combined fruits and leaves drawn in crayon by Moore on a piece of paper Sloan brought back from Jamaica and had pasted into his herbarium, with anatomical details Kikius later supplied from Sloan's dried specimen of the same species. I saw it in Jamaica. I saw it in Jamaica. This seemingly self-evident act of seeing plants in the pages of a natural history is rather to behold a subtle work of colonial scientific art. These were pictures made not in Jamaica, not in London, strictly speaking, but by movement and cunning coordination between England and the West Indies. Thank you very much. general thank you to all <laughs> the people who invited me here and are joining me and to all of you. Listening to Professor Del Borgo talk, um, I'm struck by a word and it's the process that it refers to, so preservation and its uh, reoccurring emergence in Del Borgo's talk and then the, its, its counterpart, rot and putrefaction, seem to be important dynamic, dynamics here. We hear about 
um, pictures that draw from live and preserved elements. We hear about fruits like the pineapple that couldn't be preserved. Try and smush a pineapple between um, weights <laughs> and not going to go well. Um, we hear about, uh, elsewhere in the book, we hear about the climate of Jamaica that was rainy and um, damp and we <coughs> putrefy specimens rapidly. And this is a time um, of humoral theory when people believe that the body could decay if it, and change if it spent too much time in the tropics. So preservation is, um, and rot are running through uh, Del Borgo's uh, description of, of Sloan's concerns about his specimens. Um, and so I start to wonder, you know, what theory of life or, or death does this reveal that Sloan was encountering? Sloan was a medical man and a naturalist, so he was someone who was committed to theories of life and theories of death. And what did he make of rot? You know, this is a pre-germ theory time. He wouldn't have been able to identify the microbes who were acting here. So did, was he interested, was he provoked by rot and the processes of putrefaction. Um, I wonder, was he interested in monstrous life, or did he only uh, care about perfect specimens? You know, did he only want the pristine, or was he also interested in what could be uh, learned about natural history uh, by looking to the monstrosities? Mm. We saw the um, cocoon-shaped uh, uh, collection, um, and it makes me wonder about uh, Professor Del Borgo's time in the archives. What are the, the not pristine specimens that you can tell us about? Is there anything off limits? Has anything rotted to? <laughs> and now you're getting my own <laughs> intrigue. But you know, what, what is um, not preserved? You know, what do we not have? Did Sloan lose anything? Does he ever write about receiving specimens that are unusable because of their state? And does he ever uh, express remorse about um, something that decays to a point of unusability in its transport through the Middle Passage, Jamaica, back to England. I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. I will also take Justin's words and offer a general thank you to all who organized and were involved in this event. Um, so in his impressively thorough and thoughtful book, Collecting the World, James Del Borgo reads Hans Sloan's specimens, objects, and catalogs, as well as his published and manuscript works to argue that Sloan not only collected a world of things, but just as importantly, he collected a world of people. And asking us to consider the physical objects and human contributors behind the collections, Del Borgo articulates networks of knowledge and labor around Sloan's expansive legacy, and I do mean so expansive. Um, and I would like to use my time today to consider how holding our attention on the very things collected helps us to recognize hidden and at times purposefully ignored narratives within Sloan's natural history. To do so, I want to turn to Del Borgo's attention of Sloan's engravings of various plant specimens, which conveniently he's talked about today, uh, in which he demonstrates how Sloan writes and preserves and simultaneously silences and erases. The engravings and even the accompanying text of Sloan's natural history do not always tell us who contributed to the collection and preservation of the plants or the production of the image. By focusing on these same engravings, however, Del Borgo registers not just how these images produce knowledge, but were themselves productions, undertaking the recovery work of compiling Sloan's sources to trace all those involved in creating the final engravings. By centering the images and plants in his history, he makes legible previously invisible labor, demonstrating how such examination can open up recognitions of the skills and knowledge of worksmen, enslaved individuals, and Indian persons. Of course, and I say this as a very personal investment, uh, Sloan is interested in more than botanical specimens, although they certainly form the bulk of his collections. For instance, at one point in his natural history, he notes that he collected an Indian arm bone from a burial cave, transporting it to England in order to prove that the ants of Jamaica eat through the human body until even the marrow within the bone has been consumed. I introduce this example to ask if we are to place objects that are not just collected or represented by other individuals, like plants, but are themselves human remains, what kinds of relations and stories can we trace? I see such recentering and refocusing as expanding the work that Del Borgo has painstakingly begun, that is, by turning our attention away from Sloan's presentation of such objects, and instead to the entities themselves, we begin to comprehend the latent narratives and lives that Sloan overwrites. With such attention on an arm bone, for instance, 
Uh, we are reminded of the care required to maintain a body once a person has died so that the bones can be collected and in turn in urns in the first place, um, something I think Justin was also hearkening to. Of indigenous connections to community and land that preceded Sloan and Spanish imperialism, of the continued presence of native remains and persons in Jamaica, and indeed of Sloan's own disturbance and destruction of these burial grounds upon his entry. We recognize not just skill and knowledge, but the lives and survival that Sloan's short description of this bone does not pause to recognize. By taking our cue from Dabordo, by resisting the transformation of specimens to only engravings and human remains to simply artifacts, we begin to disorder and decolonize the very stability Sloan works aims to establish. So I'm excited to hear about the conversation that will come forward. Thank you so much for this talk. Thank you. Um, so my comments today concern the selective reception that Sloan's natural history texts was received in the Caribbean among white West Indian um, readers. And I think um, that there's, I'm gonna suggest that there's this yawning chasm that emerges mid-century um, that divides the Caribbean's botanical cultures into two different types of book consumers. Um, that will explain why, um, as uh, Delbergo said, images are sometimes configured as the, leg the real legacy of this book. Um, and I think that looking at this can show us the way that uh, Sloan's natural history potentially interacted or didn't interact with other uh, genres uh, that were very popular in the Caribbean, particularly the domestic medical advice book um, and recipe books. So these two groups of readers, on the one side there are these white, gentlemen readers who envision themselves as part of this broader transatlantic community of curious observers of the natural world. And this is the group that would uh, purchase and circulate Sloan's books amongst themselves or consume it individually in their private library. And then on the other side are what the, I call uh, the practical consultors. And these form um, a demographic majority among the island's white population. And this is a group of readers um, that tend to populate the plantation managerial hierarchy. They held jobs, they don't own plantations, they hold jobs as bookkeepers or attorneys, they're not the same status as like lawyers today. Attorneys are people who just make contracts on behalf of others, and they're overseers. And they're mostly unmarried white men who come to the Caribbean as second or third sons, um, who don't stand to inherit a trade or land in England, and they may own a few slaves and aspire one day to solidify their place in the Caribbean's racial hierarchy through the purchase of their own um, plantations. But these guys are very literate because they're always writing back to absentee um, owners. And I think the, the, that um, pictures are understood as the legacy, at least in the Caribbean, um, is a product of these guys' like cultural dominance in the Caribbean um, for the rest of the 18th um, century. And here's... Um, so let me tell you more about these guys' reading practices. So these white West Indians have this appetite for scientific, chemical, and medical information that's communicated in plain English, and it's a very important context, I think, for the reception of Sloan's book. Many of Jamaican readers know that the natural histories, such as Sloan's, contain information about the potential medical application of Caribbean plants, but they found it difficult to excavate the nuggets of practical information um, that are in Sloan's thick polynomial um, descriptions. And uh, Sloan's, uh, is he, he's like his minion and his friend Henry Barham, who's uh, <laughs> Sloan's Jamaican correspondent, who's also a naturalist in his own right, writes back to Sloan. Um, and I think Barham's suggestion, Barham is a very presumptuous little guy, he makes these suggestions for how Sloan is going to change uh, the book from the first to the second edition. And I think his suggestions speak volumes about what this, uh, this one group of readers is really looking for. Um, he says, such misfortunes your labors and useful history have met with here, um, he writes to Sloan. The main objection, as Barham tried to delicately explain, is that you have written the names of several kinds of plants in Latin, which very few understand in this island. Although you have described their growth in English, yet they are to look for a name. So what he's referring to here are these, uh, these white Creoles who are looking in, paging through Sloan's that he imagines for the names of these plants and then they can go find the description of their potential use um, in the text beneath it. And that's because these guys are used to reading uh, domestic medical advice texts and recipe books 
Um, they, and these, these types of books have information about herbs and plants that are native uh, to Jamaica and other islands, but they're listed in this item by item format. And the authors and compilers of these recipe books um, typically write the title of the plant and the description in English, and rather than um, consulting them or actually reading them in extended uh, sittings, readers uh, typically dip into these books um, as needed, typically in the case of an emergency. So although Sloan's describing each plant in English, uh, these readers are really hitting a roadblock with these polynomial Latin titles that Sloan's placing at the head of each entry. And so then Barham goes on, and <laughs> he's making all these suggestions to what um, Sloan should change for the second edition. And at the top of that list, Sloan, he asks Sloan to describe in fuller detail the galenic qualities of hot, cold, wet, or dry that each plant contained so that readers might combine and use them in ways that Sloan maybe didn't know about. And this is what said Sloan's, this is what Sloan or Barham means um, when he reports that Jamaicans also wish that you had been larger in the virtues of them. And he's referring to the virtues of the plants that Sloan cataloged. So using the word virtues, he's signaling there um, that Jamaicans have this, uh, white Jamaicans have this um, leveling vision of knowledge making. They expect Sloan to provide information, not just on what ailments these plants might treat, but their like, essential uh, characteristics so that these guys can heal themselves. And then Barham, the last thing that Barham says um, for the second edition is that um, Sloan should make his next edition, quote, as plain as Culpepper's English physician. <laughs> And I can't overstate what a contrast Culpepper's English physician is in contrast to the Sloan. This is a popular midwifery combination, midwifery astrological text and recipe book. And it's an infamous book because it has a very radical critique of uh, medical monopoly um, in London. So in uh, Barham is like, yikes. I don't know how Sloan took this letter. I don't I know how Sloan to that. But uh, that's really quite presumptuous there. Um, and so Barham underscores that um, if Sloan's going to make these changes, every planter would have one of uh, Sloan's books in his house. And he says, I think the whole island ought unanimously to join in their thanks to you for the great pains, industry, and labor in compiling it so useful work, but such is the ungratefulness of some men, some men, Barham closed um, his labor. So I think that ungratefulness um, I think it makes us consider the bumpiness with which this um, very eminent um, natural history text moved throughout the Atlantic world. Um, and I also explains for me why the images were so important um, and why they are the prevailing uh, legacy. But there are some things that images cannot overcome. <laughs> the window just to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A and I'll just very briefly uh, maybe wrap up by saying um, or maybe by noticing that I think James we all want to know more about your experience in the herbarium <laughs> at least I also did like Justin um, you know I was just as I was preparing for today and going over uh, you know the passages about cacao and how it was drawn first by Moore in Jamaica and then Kikius with the you know ink on top of the pencil, I could you know imagine pouring over these drawings in the herbarium, um, and doing I think really the kind of work that is absolutely necessary to uncover, as Peter <coughs> said, or to recover um, the history of Jamaica's influence and contributions to this natural history that is now in London and considered part of you know the Museum of Natural History in London or the British Museum. Um, and I think the one thing that I find really uh, helpful and stimulating about James's work is how he really prompts us to reconsider not just you know individual plans or books, but uh, you know entire categories. <coughs> like why is it the British Museum? Why is it not perhaps the Jamaican Museum, <laughs> the British Jamaican Museum, the Atlantic Museum, whatever the Global Imperial Museum, whatever you want to call it? Um, why is it Sloan versus Moore and Kikius? Um, and why don't we, um, you know, given that I think another one of James's big points in his book is that uh, we shouldn't consider museums and archives these, these fixed, stable, 
um, set in stone, unchanging collections or places that these collections were made by real human beings, um, and supposedly for other human beings to take, uh, you know, profit, pleasure, instruction <coughs> from. So why can't we also rethink these collections now today um, and do things like, you know, pull out the herbarium specimen of the millet plant and say, uh, look for an alternate collection within Sloan's collection mm -hmm. that was really created by um, uh, enslaved Africans and others working in the provision grounds of Jamaica. So, okay. thank you. Do you want to quickly start? Oh. <laughs> or should we just take Q&A? What would you prefer, Vanessa? We have some time, so go ahead, ask your question. <clears throat> uh, so again, it's, it's such an honor, uh, the, the thoughtfulness um, of, of all of these uh, comments. Um, I'll try to be very brief. In order, Justin, Christine, <laughs> life and death. Sloan is a, essentially a physical theologian, as you know, who believes that the world has essentially not changed since the creation. However, within that, towards the end of his life, he does uh, publish an article about uh, what we would call extinction um, and climate change uh, affecting the um, existence of, of mammoths. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean that he completely uh, changes his views in any systematic way, um, and it doesn't change the structure in which he collects, which I would argue um, is, you know, essentially non-temporal, um, <clears throat> and the world is a static, rational machine designed by God to be catalogued. It's eternal. That's that's the structure, and that's the animating spirit. Although he does change some, but some of that view towards the end of his life. All the animals rot. Thousands of animals. All the plants still there. All the animals rot. They're all gone, apart from one. Viper fish. They were thrown out at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. There were gleeful bonfires organized by British Museum curators who, who and there are descriptions of these smells of burning snakes wafting down the stairs of the museum in, in a kind of purge, in a kind of regime purge. So in many ways, of course, Sloan is being purged. He's being, he's being preserved and wiped out, which takes me to Kimberley's um, point about caves, uh, what, uh, which is an excellent one. And, and bones, what are, what are bones? What, what is hair? Um, there's some interesting work um, being done recently in Australia about ongoing difficulties of how to classify hair. Is hair to be regarded as some sort of an extraneous uh, uh, substance to a human body, or is it integral to a human body? And there's been great museological misclassification, misunderstanding, and that changes, to speak to Julie's point. These things are seem stable, but of course they can change. Preservation and destruction, of course, go together in many instances, and this is the case with Sloan. He, and, and many collectors, of course, to, to preserve is to change. It's really, you know, I, I think often that collecting is really making, and it's making something that wouldn't otherwise be there in that form. There are so many versions of this, whether it's, for example, the use of phonography around 1900 to preserve the voices of Native Americans, which was one of the great first Edisonian phonographic uh, objectives. In making the recording, they were often producing sounds that weren't, uh, that wouldn't have been there originally, either through uh, dints of performance or through the sheer noisiness of the recording instrument. That, I think, is broadly true, that to, to preserve is often to destroy, as in the case of bones, as in the case of that cave. Sloan takes musical instruments from slaves, and we have the music that he records from somebody who was fully invested in profiting from, from everything that slavery was. So we have a very interesting relationship between preservation and destruction and the idea of collecting and preserving as really making something new. Um, Claire's wonderful comments take me back to what I didn't talk to all of you about, which was Sloane's words. And they entirely confirm uh, Claire's diagnosis, which is that the words Sloane provides in the Natural History of Jamaica about 
species like cacao are all about the medicinal uses and the commercial values of chocolate. I encourage you to con uh, consult the bumpy, full of friction, not very well written, not <laughs> classic, right? Sloan has not, in, he's both canonical and non-canonical. Reading Sloan with undergrads, good luck. <laughs> it's not Linnaean, it's not the later 18th century, it's not the 19th century, it's not that kind of uh, choreography. It's in, and this is what Claire has referred to, that, that Sloan tried to be everywhere and couldn't be. You couldn't be learned, polynomial, and be read by colonists who often lack the educational background. So what Sloan tried to do, uh, he put an enormous amount of effort into, and it was not possible. But an interesting way, of course, to think about this is the tension between words and pictures. It would seem as though pictures, as was much theorized at the time, would travel, would be a kind of universal language where words would be a barrier. And there's obviously something important to that. The thing about that is that in making the text travel, it changes the text. So that Linnaeus's account of pictures is, as it were, part of the high history of botanical classification. What Sloan meant to generate by this useful medicine on the ground, profit, for London investors is entirely emptied out. So we have a very, a very interesting challenge to the idea, uh, received wisdom in botany, that what counted about this were pictures of species <coughs> rather than accountings uh, of commodities. Finally, Julie's point, what did happen uh, to me um, in the herbarium? Um, <laughs> two points I think about this uh, difficult to articulate issue, but very important. One is that I was struck um, forcibly by conditions of access varying uh, by kind of material. I was never alone with objects in the British Museum. That is not how the British Museum operates. Uh, I was never, I was certainly reading manuscripts in the British Library reading room, but I was never alone with the manuscripts as a collection, apart from 10 minutes that were given to me by a very kind curator who said throughout the 10 minutes, you're not supposed to be here, let's make it quick. Uh, that was when I was able to see the manuscripts as a whole and get that sense. So what I won't be able to articulate, but what you might well be able to appreciate, that with collections, uh, there is an artifice of presence that, that must come in and inform uh, our way of relating to them. This is also Julie's point about it's the Jamaica Museum, it's the, you know, you're absolutely right, somehow the founding British botanical collection is Jamaican. Um, so there is, a, there is something that is useful for us to think about, which is the transmigration of other people's labor into our collections, and they continue to work in the present. They continue to be canonized, even if people forgot who Sloan was, because that's the Natural History Museum, that's the Darwin Center, right? It's literally being nested, if you'll pardon that metaphor, within the hallowed halls of canonical Western science, botany, at the heart of the Darwin Center, as Hans Sloan is Jamaica, the people of Jamaica, which is an extraordinarily under-acknowledged um, uh, history, of course. But the place where I had access to objects and could spend uh, hours uh, poring over them, thinking about them, trying to understand what to do with them, were the plants in the herbarium, um, without supervision for many hours, because plants were evidently, in some sense, a lower order of collection <laughs> In this, in this hierarchy, it's okay for Del Borgo to be in there, go for a tea break, just you know, make sure you lock the door on your way out. And so being alone with those collections and being uh, flummoxed by them for a long time, and then finding a way through history of science, visual culture, museum studies, uh, cobbling together a methodology that would then, yes, look at plants and think about how does that become a picture of species, this particular grabbed a uh, set of roots and, and, and uh, petals and so on. But then also to think and populate that world. What I saw myself as doing, final point, was, was less a story of erasure, more a story of repopulating the scene of collection, knowledge making, labor hierarchy, strife and knowledge and interaction 
that, you know, could you look at those plants and imagine the conditions under which they were taken and imagine what those relations were even when the herbarium was not documenting that information uh, for you. So that was the exercise I, I came to understand myself as undertaking by spending this time alone with these hundreds of plants uh, in the Natural History Museum. So there's something irreducible about the presence of the object, not that of course it is a return to the place, not to be romantic in that sense, but also to grant that there is a kind of extraordinary power in that encounter with the object, which one then tries to work one's, one's sense through. Without that, I think it's a different kind of a project. And I, the final thing I'll say on this is really that experience with the plants. I think there is a strange parallel. Sloan, as I said, the Holy of Holies is his collection of plants. And this was the research experience for me that really sustained me over the long haul, <laughs> a kind of physical, uh, curiosity about these tangible remnants of these histories. Um, that was a very sustaining and, and inspiring thing to try and work through. So I, I, I encourage all uh, people who work on texts to combine their textual analyses with, with analyses of things. So thank you for a wonderful set of comments. There's five minutes oh, time. <laughs> um, Mr. Uh, the Borger will be back to get your questions. Please. Please, yes. Could you tell a little bit more about Sloan's, if, if that is at all possible, about Sloan's sources of knowledge about plant uses in Jamaica? I mean, you mentioned there was a knowledgeable planter and, and he had a guide, but did he just spoke to a few people? Is, is, is that all written down, documented, or...? Well, let, uh, thank you for the question. Do I need to stand at the podium for you? Yeah. 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 You will be record... You can take the microphone off. You make I'll, it I'll take the microphone off. I'll put that in front of you. There you go. Thank you. Oh, did I just press something. Am I still on? I'm still yeah. on. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I've done my best to, of course, document this in the book as much as possible. What I would say is that, of course, planters are an enormous source of information. He's moving around the island, but he's observing a slave ship that is unloading its cargo. And while in the text, you know, the text, as Claire was saying, the text doesn't give you unity, but the unities of time and place. So you don't know what happens where. You know that it takes many years to generate. So you have to think, of course, it's a conversation with planters up and down Port Royal, up to St. Anne's, through 16 mile walk, uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. That's going on constantly, chit-chatting about plants, commodities, slave rebellions have just been going on. He, he, he omits that quite extraordinarily. There have been, there have been very uh, extensive slave rebellions before he gets there. And then, you know, when it comes to, to enslaved people, of course it's a matter of, of inference, where he does not entertain at great length. Um, whatever, whatever, as it were, interpretative testimony uh, he would get from, from uh, Africans in the island, slaves in, in the island. This goes back to what, what Claire was, uh, back to Henry Barham, for example, who was in Jamaica right after him, has a lot more to say about African or, or, or black Jamaican constructions of medicine and how medicines work on the body. So there are clearly people in this period who spend much more time on that um, and are more attentive. So whatever Sloan is gleaning from slaves, he's thinking of that information as kind of a brute materiality, what grows where, what is effective. Um, and, and this is a, 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 a by no means uncommon uh, European or colonial way to filter that which seems practically useful. They know about things that maybe nobody else does. We don't need to bother with their particular cosmological constructions of them. So Sloan is not particularly good at, for example, he does not discuss obia. He does not discuss any of these things which other people are discussing. So, so I think, I think this comes back to the learned, um, the learned gentleman who wants to subject all of this to a kind of natural historical discipline that will lead to his acclamation. I don't know if we've lost our slides. Uh, that first portrait. Thank you, Vanessa. You're very welcome. Go. This, this, <laughs> this portrait is, is useful um, to, to navigate a number of the comments and also your question, which is that this is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. It's painted when Sloan is president of the Royal Society. There he is with a, uh, a drawing of Jamaican Laguetta. Uh, 
it's for him, what counts is how this will work in London. Yes, he wants to reach his, the book is intended to be useful, it doesn't turn out to be so useful, but it's part of his affirmation of, as a man of letters. So it's this tension between practicality and also being acclaimed as a learned man. He had a rather humble background in some way. So this is part of his own climb, and it's a metropolitan climb. Other questions? Yes. And I was sort of wondering, um, in that process, were mistakes made? Because um, it, it's been about like 10 years or so, and mm. some people are drawing off of dried specimens, and the dried specimens never quite look the same as real. Um, and I was just wondering if there were errors. Um. <laughs> it must be an unfair question. Yes, no, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, the question for me is, you know, who would in that situation define what an error would be? Um, but Sloan does write in uh, some corrections and says, you know, the stalk is wrong. <laughs> so Sloan is overseeing on some basis of what? Memory? Uh, on some basis of uh, his own judgment um, years later that it doesn't look right to him. So he's you know, there is this, this uh, slightly antagonistic relationship or agonistic relationship between drafts people and those who employ them, the gentleman authors. Um, so there are moments where you, you see Sloan correcting, and in fact there are, I can tell you, um, criticisms made of the, the natural history of Jamaica. Again, yet more um, evidence for the incredible success of this volume. Uh, people in the in second volume, Sloan acknowledges that there have been uh, critics who say that there have been mistakes made in the engravings. And very interestingly indeed, he says at one point, if there are certain errors, uh, you, you know, dear reader, do not worry, you may have recourse to my words. <laughs> and, 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 and he says, so there is the, there is the gentleman assuming, uh, 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 asserting the authority of his words over what he calls the mistakes of his workmen. He uses the word workmen for his, for his uh, picture makers. So that um, tense labor hierarchy, you can see at work um, uh, disagreements and also a, a, a process of taking credit and also, shall we say, delegating discredit, <laughs> which, which obviously is a very important thing for a great gentleman author um, uh, uh, to do. But we know on the more glorious side, he gets the Linnaean uh, seal of approval uh, later on. So, so, but no, in, in that sense, yes, one can historicize the question of error um, and there are enormous fights in these incredibly um, wordy entries where on some entries Sloan will um, uh, have enormous uh, um, uh, uh, you know, grief to express about attacks made on him by Leonard Klucknet, rival botanist who criticizes some of his figures as completely made. So in other words, there, there is a, a considerable amount of credit at stake and animus engaged on the question of accurate uh, picture making in botany at this time. So one can historicize the question and it, it's, it's a very polemical uh, and heated exchange. Thank you. We have time for one quick question. Um, I have a question about Hans Sloan as um, president of the Royal Society. So he took over after Isaac Newton, correct? So I was wondering, is, was there some sort of change in the type of experiments that were approved by the society you know, because I'm thinking back to Newton and his problem with Pope, and then we have Sloan with his problem with the other botanists. So was there some sort of change in the, I don't know, the temperament of the, the ex experiments that they were advocating post-Newton for Sloan? Thank you very much. Um, and certainly there are enormous tensions between different kinds of fellows. Um, so that, broadly speaking, okay, to begin with, Sloan was, of course, a naturalist and a physician, and he was not a natural philosopher. He conducted <coughs> experimental trials, but not within the purview of natural philosophy. I mean, he conducted experimental <coughs> uh, dissections, for example, of Sumatran elephants with colleagues like the antiquarian William Stukeley. Um, he uh, was a patron, certainly, as secretary of the Royal Society in the 1690s, and then becoming president uh, later, he was very... Uh, careful to use his enormous wealth <laughs> to, to um, help sponsor things like the Copley Medal. Uh, Sloan's money is behind that. It's extraordinary the degree to which he's underwriting 
uh, the institutions of which he is a member, including the Royal College of Physicians, including Chelsea Physic Garden, where he you know, pays 100 pounds for repair of the Watergate. Other Watergate. Um, <laughs> I went somewhere else there for a second. Um, so he is, he is very um, a, a, a skilled operator in terms of patronizing those who do different kinds of work, whether these be uh, uh, Francis Hawksby, for example, conducting experiments on, on magnetism and so on and so forth. For all of that, there is an enormous polemic about the uh, intellectual squalor of natural history uh, with respect to the um, uh, halcyon uh, achievements, the, the, the godlike um, of the capacities of a Newton. So that when Sloan becomes, you know, Woodward and, and Newton, I mean, there's personal disagreements, there's ideological disagreements, there's a lot of collaboration. After a while, Slo uh, Newton and Woodward uh, get Sloan booted from his editorship of the Philosophical Transactions, uh, partly because, nat you know, natural philosophers are a little bit taken aback, I think, when Hans Sloan uh, has all of these strange essays on curious subjects published in the pages of that journal. For example, his librarian, a man by the name of Thomas Stack, reported to him the case of a 68-year-old woman who lived on Tottenham Court Road, whose name was Elizabeth Bryan. Uh, Stack told Sloan, she's a very interesting woman, she's 68, and she can squeeze her breast milk uh, several yards into the air. <laughs> so Sloan uh, commissioned an article on that, which we can, we can go home and read, perhaps in the library somewhere. Uh, so, so you contrast that with what Voltaire will say about the genius of England, Newton, <laughs> liberty, it gives you some idea of a kind of wonderfully uh, ribald uh, 18th century scurrilous uh, mudslinging fight over what the glories of science in the age of Newton are supposed to be. And this is, this is one reason why Sloane, the, the dunderhead, uh, the mere lover of baubles, um, must confine himself to this lower order of merely examining the dimension and shade uh, of a particular kind of, you know, strawberry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Thank you all for coming. Dr. Del Burgo will sign books around the corner, and I'm sure you have some other questions, and he will be able to answer a few of those. This afternoon, Dr. Del Burgo will be in our herbarium. So <laughs> there are 8.2 million specimens. So you will be here for a while, and we expect another book. On your herbarium? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Can I be in there alone? Absolutely. Oh. Can you speak to, uh, to um, Barbara Tears and Matthew Pace, and they will help you and leave you alone. I don't know whether you have tea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for fine. coming. Uh, ask me for a garden class and get this wonderful book around the corner. Enjoy the garden. It's a glorious day, and you will have a fantastic beginning to the weekend. Bye bye. Thank you.